an unexpected medical emergency that you may face is not an indicator of your credit worthiness. If I go buy a car and decide not to pay for the car, that's a decision I make. It's reflective of what I, how I view credit, what I do with things. If God forbid I have a heart attack, I didn't plan for that to happen. And if I get overwhelming medical bills and if they needed to helicopter and medevac me somewhere and I needed all these emergency services and insurance for one reason or another didn't cover it or, or, or there were large numbers when I end up with a couple hundred thousand dollars in medical bills that are, that are unpaid, that's not necessarily a credit decision. It's Ashley. We are back with another episode of Our Bite You. And today we have a special guest. He's been on before. We have Rick Purr, the owner and partner at Kaufman Dolowich. And today we're going to be talking about how to modernize your dispute process and prepare for the future and safety or safely collect on medical debt as well. We are both actually attending the Northeast Debt Collection Expo next week. This is something that Rick is talking on there. So You'll get a little snippet of it before that conference. So let's dive right into it. If you can, I, I always say this every time you're on this show. I know everyone knows you, but if there's people who aren't familiar with you, can you give us just some background on you and your company for those people? Sure. And I appreciate Ashley and you and everyone at Arbyte for having me on. We've had a great relationship over the years and, and Arbyte does such a fantastic job both supporting the industry and providing technology that is sorely needed um, by all of our agency partners. So thanks again for everything that you're doing. For everyone out there, I'm Rick Purr. I am a past ACA president. I am also a partner at the national law firm Kaufman Dolowich. I am the co-managing partner of our Philadelphia office, but I also chair our consumer financial services practice nationwide. We have a, a number of lawyers who are representing agencies in the industry. We do everything from defense to compliance to representation before government bodies. And we like to try and keep all of our clients out of trouble as much as we can. If they get into a little bit of trouble, we try and make sure that it's a, a, a little bit less trouble than what it otherwise would be. So happy to be here. Happy to talk about the whole credit reporting process and medical debt, which is something that is, has, it's an issue all the time because between the government between regulatory bodies and now the consumer reporting agencies, they make sure that they make it complicated enough so that all of you out there need a lawyer to help you try and understand it. So that's what we'll try and do a little bit in the next couple of minutes. Perfect. Yeah, for sure. All good stuff. So can you just provide an overview of challenges that businesses commonly face when it does come to their dispute processes or collecting on medical debt, just to jump things off with of that? Sure. When you're collecting debt, as everyone out there knows, either through your own choice or through an obligation you have with the creditor, you may be credit reporting. And by that, you subscribe to one of the private consumer reporting agencies, and they are private for-profit companies. They are not the government. It's important to understand that the government regulates those companies, but your participation is voluntary. Their product is voluntary, and it's all for-profit. You make the decision to, to provide information on a consumer report. If you do that, you have certain obligations that you have to adhere to. And in our area, it's primarily either through the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which has a very limited but still strong aspect of Section 8, which deals with reporting false information. You have to be aware of that and what the rules are under the FDCPA, which is a strict liability statute. And under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which identifies you as a data furnisher, and that is Section 1681 S2 A and B, and really B is the important part for a data furnisher. And you have that obligation to make sure that the, if you receive a dispute, that um, you engage in a reasonable read of the information and provide that it, results of that investigation to the consumer reporting agency within 30 days. If you don't do that, it's automatically removed. But at, at an outset, you have both those statutes that govern what you have to do or what regulations cover you when you are doing 
consumer reporting generally. On the flip side, the just a generic dispute that has nothing to do with consumer reporting, but just receipt of a dispute, six, eight, uh, FDCPA 1692G requires you, if within the first 30 days after sending out the validation notice, you receive a dispute, you have to mark the account as disputed and hold off doing any further collection activity until after you provide a response to the validation request. That's a little different than the credit reporting, but it's an important aspect, particularly if you are operating within those first 30 days to know that you got to stop until you validate the debt. And, and we won't get into the validation here. We'll talk a little bit more about in the Northeast debt, but I don't want to waste our airtime for the whole validation process. Yeah, gotcha. This next question, it has a lot to do with compliance. And honestly, you gave us straight to the point exactly where people need to be looking for these compliance. Uh, maybe talking more now specifically about the medical debt. I know, obviously, rules and regulations on medical debt have changed as well. Uh, what role does data privacy and security play in modernizing dispute processes or handling medical debt? Are there specific compliance considerations to be aware of, which again, you just mentioned those, but I don't know if there's any more, maybe specifically with the medical uh, debt side of things. Sure. And there's two aspects and it, and it was a great question, Ashley. And so there's two, two aspects to collecting on medical debt, particularly when you're dealing with disputes and dealing with consumer reporting. One is on a, a regulatory side. Everyone's familiar with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Privacy Protection Act with the Health Information Pri Privacy Protection Act, HIPAA, which says you can't give certain medical information to anyone other than the patient unless they're authorized. So from the get-go, what you have to know, and, and, and almost everybody who's out there is collecting medical debt understands that, that there are HIPAA obligations. If, for example, you're getting a dispute or a request from information coming in from a credit repair organization, even a lawyer representing the consumer, a spouse, anyone like that, you may need HIPAA authorization from the consumer themselves before you even provide that information. So you have to be careful there just at the outset of making sure that if you are not talking to the consumer themselves, the patient, you need HIPAA authorization if you don't already have it to talk to one of those third parties, not about the substance of the debt, but about anything that contains personal health information. So you may be able to tell somebody you owe $250. You probably are not going to be able to tell them you owe $250 for an X-ray. Mm -hmm. Because now you just jumped into a boundary that's protected information. Yeah. So we have, we have HIPAA on one side. The other aspect of the dispute that, that comes in is that the consumer reporting agencies on their own have enacted their own personal rules about medical debt. And this is very important because this is not... The government, the government didn't do this. The CFPB didn't say this. Congress has not enacted any law regarding medical debt. Now, there are certain states that are always active on credit reporting and medical debt. And there's a, a little bit of question about what length they can go to because it's a federal law and they can't preempt the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But the consumer reporting agencies have enacted three big items that you have to be aware of. And anyone who's collecting medical debt needs to know that. Item number one, any paid medical account, whether it was in collections, not in collections, any type, once it is paid in full, it falls off the consumer's report. That's automatic. The, the CRAs are taking it off. Aid medical accounts, doesn't matter. They're gone. So if you pay your, if a consumer pays their medical account, it's automatically going to be deleted and removed from their consumer report. The second one is, that the CRAs are not going to report and allow debt to be reported on a consumer report if the date of service is less than one year from the time that you're reporting it. So people have a one-year grace period. If you're getting an account in, and, and one of the key fields that you're going to fill in when you fill out your eOscar is going to say date of service. And if you put in January 1st, 3, and it's still 2023, it's not going to appear on the report. It's got to wait until January 1st, 2024, before that will appear on a report. So that field in and of itself is going to block it. 
just like your block telephone calls that go to a, an area code that's not within the appropriate time frame. The CRAs have complex algorithms and computer programming that will not let trade lines that have a date of service less than one year from when it's being submitted. And then the last area, which is the most complicated and there are no great answers. There's a lot of ambiguity is that they will not allow on a consumer report an obligation where the initial owed balance that is after insurance, after everything is less than $500. So if you're going to collect a hundred medical debt, it's not going to appear on a consumer report. And the CRAs on their own voluntarily have decided they are not going to allow that to come into place. Now, there's a lot of questions about what happens if a creditor places four $125 accounts with you for the same consumer or same patient at the same time. Does that now suddenly become $525 and you get to report it? It's not a question that's been answered yet by the CRAs themselves, although many of us lawyers in this field have our opinions about whether you can or can't. And it's important to talk to your lawyer about what their viewpoint is when you have an aggregate placement at a single time, maybe multiple dates of service, but still one creditor, and the aggregate exceeds that amount, can I place that uh, on a consumer report and put the, the total bulk amount, $525, uh, or am I forced to try and report it as four $125 accounts, in which case each of those four would be prevented from appearing. So that's the dilemma that everyone's facing right now. And we've even seen some recently lawsuit filed out in California by a, an aggrieved doctor who claims that this is somehow an antitrust violation. It'll be interesting to follow that along. Again, I have some opinions about the merits of that type of lawsuit, but you never know. There's a reason why there's a few other people that wear black robes and, and they're the ones that make decisions. Wow, that's a lot of information. I told you before we started filming this, I don't know too much about this stuff. And I feel like I'm probably learning along with everyone who's going to watch this video. There's so much to it. So that's crazy. <laughs> and I'm sure there's more, which kind of brings me to my next question. Are there any upcoming bills around the dispute process or medical debt that agencies should be preparing for? Yeah, there's nothing that is on the verge of passing. Medical debt is a really touchy policy position. And I want all your viewers to understand that when it comes to legislators and regulators, they make sometimes decisions that based on what they think is better policy for people. And, and there, there is some merit in the argument that an unexpected medical emergency that you may face is not an indicator of your credit worthiness. If I go buy a car and decide not to pay for the car, that's a decision I make. It's reflective of what I, how I view credit, what I do with things. If God forbid I have a heart attack, I didn't plan for that to happen. And if I get overwhelming medical bills and if they needed to helicopter and medevac me somewhere and I needed all these emergency services and insurance for one reason or another didn't cover it or, or, or there were large numbers when I end up with a couple hundred thousand dollars in medical bills that are, that are unpaid, that's not necessarily a credit decision that I've made and a choice that I made in terms of paying or not paying. Those type of scenarios and, and, and regulators and legislators wrestle with should that be appearing on your consumer report? Because is that really reflective of should you get future credit? We understand it's an obligation you may owe. We understand you may have to pay it. But is it something that needs to reflect your credit worthiness? And so that debate is going on in state houses around the country and with the regulators. And they argue about, you know, that's the focus of what they look at with medical bills, not the fact that it should be on there you should, as a tool for repayment but rather whether it's reflective of your credit worthiness that other creditors are going to look at. So that debate happens, and, and we always see somebody somewhere trying to propose something with respect to limiting the ability of medical debt to appear on a consumer report. Right now, there's nothing that has any significant chance of passage, but it's a policy debate that goes on at the highest levels of government and just even regardless of party, both Democrats and Republicans tend to have a sense that there's something unfair about unexpected medical events 
being an indicator of credit worthiness. From that end, there's probably going to go, it's probably going to go further to what extent, I'm not sure, but it's something that, that uh, unifies both Democrats and Republicans, one of the few things in, in government. And so while we see those pushes, I think that people struggle with what gets included and what doesn't get included. You do make a conscious choice not to pay a copay when you mm -hmm. go in for a well visit. If you're going to have cosmetic surgery, which is clearly an elective process, people make conscious decisions not to pay those. Th there is definitely a debate about each of those areas and how do you write legislation or do something yeah. that controls, uh, the, that, that keeps the stuff that you elect versus the stuff you don't elect because some things still reflect credit worthy. That's, that's going to be tough to make a decision on that in the long run because there is so many different things that can happen that would constitute it being credit report worthy or not, or consumer report worthy or not. I mean, how you were saying people don't go and plan to have a heart attack, but people do plan and go do have co cosmetic surgery. And it's, that's interesting to, I would like to follow that along and like, see how, how that ends up playing out. Cause there's a lot to that for sure. Right. And the more complicated it is and the, the bigger struggle it is, the difficult, the more difficulty you have of having legislators reach a common ground. And that's what holds up that type of legislation. Yeah. Well, to wrap up medical debt, what are you seeing your clients do to prepare for upcoming changes in medical debt, if any? A lot of people are, again, the, the big focus is on the $500 rule right now. And even those in the field who, who, and I've talked to a lot of people with a lot of strong opinions that being able to put things on a consumer report helps in collection. And if it's totally removed in its entirety, the difficulty they're going to have in convincing people to pay low balance accounts without that extra sort of stick that you need to get collections. So people are trying to figure it out. And if the answer is come up that, that you can bundle accounts, then maybe it's asking creditors to wait until the amount owed exceeds $500 before placement. Maybe there's some strategic aspects of it in that regard that uh, will be necessary between the collection agencies and creditors to work on a solution that will allow them to continue to report. But again, from cash flow and other things, the you know, doctors will be like, I didn't pay 125, I'm placing 125 with you. But they gotta wait for, think about it, you gotta wait for services for someone not to pay. Are yeah. you gonna wait for someone not to pay you and continue to treat them? Or are you gonna simply wait for the first one know that you're not getting paid, know it's not getting the credit reported and then move on from that patient. So there's a little bit to work out and I think it's really the collectability and, and how they're gonna see low balance accounts be collectible in the future without ha having an extra stick. Doesn't mean that they're not gonna be a collectible, it's just you may have to apply some different strategies. Yeah, cool. And then wrapping up disputes, what are some key strategies or technologies that businesses can adopt to streamline their dispute processes? The, the big complaint about dispute processes is the time it takes to respond. And the sheer overwhelming response from consumers who their initial reaction is dispute and you got to respond to it. It takes a lot of manpower and that costs money. So people have to develop, an agency has to develop an, an efficient system, understand the rules, understand that within the 30 days of the validation period, you got to stop collection activity and respond to the dispute. It, it's a limited response, but you still have to do it. On the credit reporting side, you have 30 days when you get the e-Oscar in to, to respond or it's going to be removed from the consumer report. To understand that you have to talk to the creditor about it and at least double check with them. You can't just look at your own records and that's time consuming. It's about creating a model of efficiency to follow the, the rules and to make sure that your employees are trained enough to move these things along to where they good, need to get to on the next step so that it's a constant flow and you're able to, to at least do the best you can with very tra well-trained people to get it done quickly because it, it, is, it is burdensome, but it's necessary because the law requires it. If you want to keep it on the consumer report, you got to respond to those EOSCAR disputes. If you want to keep collecting, 
you have to respond to the written dispute within the 30 days of the validation period. The, the cost of not doing that far exceeds your cost to do it because the, the lawsuits now, we are seeing the lawsuits on the FDCPA side, the average settlement's up to 5,000, maybe even a little bit more. And that's a high price to pay for one count that you didn't follow the right uh, process. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Those are all the questions that I had. You are very knowledgeable. We always love having you on here. So the last thing I am just going to let you have, it's a little plug for you. Where can people get in contact if they want to do business with you or have questions or anything like that? And we'll also include this in our post as well for you. That's great. I appreciate that. Look, anyone that, that first of all, anyone that can see us at, at the Northeast Debt Collection Conference or anywhere else that we're appearing, but our per at kdvlaw.com, kaufmandolowich.com. You just look us up. Great way to, to just email, talk to us, our whole team is out there looking for anybody who needs uh, some assistance with compliance advice, litigation defense, and even on the technology and for making sure that the products out there are compliant, such as uh, the great work we've done together, Ashley, with Arbyte and, and making sure that you know, Arbyte has great compliant products that, that are effective in the industry. So we're out there happy to help and I look forward to seeing all the smiling faces down in Atlantic City. Hopefully people are, are losing money at the tables and, and not in uh, consumer litigation. I agree. I agree. And for anyone going to Northeast Debt Collection Expo next week, you have your chance to talk to Rick there. So make sure you go sign up, register. It's a great conference. And that's all. Thank you so much again, Rick. And I'll see you next week. Sounds great, Ash. Take care. Mm -hmm.